Our scripture reading for this morning is from John chapter 1, verses 29 to 42. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. John the Baptist was indeed a voice of one crying in the desert. John, a cousin of Jesus, who wore funny clothes made out of camel hair and ate locusts and wild honey is one who truly prepares the way for the emergence of Jesus on the scene of his ministry. He preached repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And he often baptized those who did repent there, perhaps, in the River Jordan. He developed quite a following. In fact, there were many people who followed John the Baptist. They loved what he had to say. They were enamored with what he had to say. They wanted to cling to every word. And yet, even in the midst of this great following, John never makes more of himself than he is. Always pointing to another who is greater than he. One who would come not baptizing with mere water, but baptizing with the Holy Spirit. It was John that Jesus wanted more than anyone else to baptize him. One of the great mysteries of the church this day is why would our Lord need baptized when he's sinless? And yet Jesus wanted John to baptize him and he did. And according to John's gospel, that day John the Baptist witnessed the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit upon Jesus. He saw the Spirit descending like a dove. And from that day forward, 
he would proclaim as long as he lived that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Shortly after this great event, in fact, the very next day, John was out walking with two of his disciples. One of them happened to be Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, whom we know so well. As Jesus approached, John looked at Jesus, got the attention of His disciples and said, Look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. After hearing those words, Andrew and the other disciple of John tear off after Jesus. <laughs> they literally track Him down. And when they approach Jesus, Our Lord invites them to come to His home where He's staying, to the place where He is. And they'll spend the entire day there with Jesus. I would love to have been a church mouse at that point, listening in on all those great conversations they must have had. Later that evening, Andrew would depart from Jesus and return to his home where Simon Peter was. And when he reaches his brother, he immediately says to him, We have found the Messiah. The people of God had been longing for Messiah for many years. All the way back to the time of Isaiah the prophet, they had been looking for Messiah to come. The great deliverer, the one who would set the captives free. Andrew and Peter were no different. They were among those who were hoping, perhaps praying, that in their lifetime they would witness the coming of the Messiah. And lo, He is here. And Andrew tells his brother Peter that we found the Messiah and immediately they go back to see Jesus. This brief account records two scenes of great witness. One by John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God. The other by Andrew, who says we found the Messiah. And in both cases, notice the response. There is an immediate response, is there not, when these great leaders of the church encountered Jesus for the first time. For those two disciples of John, they immediately took off after Jesus. If this is the Lamb of God, we're going to get to know Him. <laughs> we're going to spend some time with Him. We want to pick His brain, if you will. And the same is true of Peter. I wouldn't be at all surprised if it wasn't Peter who was saying, come on, Andrew, let's go. Let's go. I want to see the Messiah. When we encounter Jesus, it always brings about a response. No matter where it is, what that encounter may be, it always brings about a response. It's a little like that aha moment when so many of us in this room first discovered that Jesus was the Christ for ourselves. When we realized, perhaps for the first time, that we could be forgiven of our sins and cleansed from all unrighteousness. It brought great joy to your heart that day, didn't it? To know that you've been set free. It's like that encounter when we say yes to Jesus in answering a call on our lives. 
when we realize for the first time that God has a purpose for our lives, that God has true meaning for our lives. And we answer that call. It may be like that moment when you suddenly found yourself desiring to become more engaged in a ministry, in something that God had given you a heart for, a passion for. Any way you look at it, when we encounter Jesus, it always leads to a response. One of the first responses that I always think of when I think of encountering Jesus is one of joy. It's one of thanksgiving, of praise, of gratitude, of being in awe. That's what I think of when I think of encountering Jesus. When these disciples of John first encountered the Lamb of God, they couldn't wait to get to Jesus and spend some time with Him. When Peter learned that Andrew had seen the Messiah, he didn't want to wait a moment to get to where Jesus was. And that's what praise and thanksgiving and gratitude and all and all these things do for us. We hear a witness of the saving grace of Jesus Christ and the next thing you know, we become the witnesses. We're the one who are sharing the good news of Jesus and His love. When we encounter Jesus, it ought to always produce a joyous response. But one thing I've learned over the years, not everyone who encounters Christ, especially for the first time, automatically responds with joy. For some, it means rejection or not yet. But even those persons who encounter Christ often discover in their lives that that was a pivotal moment in their lives when they first began to think about the need for something greater than what they had already. The need to find fulfillment. The need to find real joy in their lives. Something that would give them purpose. Something that would satisfy. But for those of us who believe, there ought to always be a resounding joy that comes from our hearts whenever we encounter the Christ. Therefore, my dear friends, I'm going to set you free today. You are free to praise God whenever the Lord touches your heart. Is that okay? You're free to praise God. You don't have to hold back. Because you see, that response of praise that you offer becomes a witness to those around us. And they, in turn, may discover all the joy, all the peace, all the hope that only Jesus can bring. Second, an encounter with Christ leads often to a response of saying yes to a calling on our hearts. God called me to be a pastor, to be a preacher, a teacher. I've told many of you at least part of this story. When, when I was in college and really from junior high on, I wanted to go to law school. I was going to be a lawyer. Believe that, Jeremiah, it's true. <laughs> Jeremiah's a lawyer. <laughs> he knows this. <laughs> and I was all set for that. And sometime between my junior and senior year in college, I felt for the first time a calling on my heart to ministry. And folks, I put up a pretty good argument with God on that one. I said, couldn't you use a few good Christian lawyers out there? I mean, you know, what's wrong with that? <laughs> but God called me to this ministry and, and I, I wrestled with that because I had to say, who am I? 
Who am I that I would ever be worthy to stand in a place like this before a great congregation like this to proclaim good news? Who am I? And yet God chose me. And I thank God to this day that more than 40 years ago I said yes. There's a calling on every heart in this room. Do you realize that? It may not be to ordain ministry like Krista and I, but folks, there's a calling on all of our hearts. For some of you, that calling is to meet the needs of those less fortunate than you. Others in this room may be called to teach. Claudia, you are a great teacher. Others in this room may be called in other ways, perhaps to a ministry of encouraging so that others can live out their potential. Wouldn't that be exciting to think that you helped someone reach their potential in life? Still, someone else in this room may be called to a ministry of philanthropy. You've been blessed by God, and God is saying to you, why don't you share some of that? So that hearts and lives can be transformed. Still, someone else in this room may be called to a ministry of witness or evangelism. And I'm going to say this once and clear. You don't have to be ordained to be a witness. <laughs> to share the love of Christ. You don't have to do that, folks. Many of the greatest evangelists I've ever known never went to seminary. Never took a Bible class. Never did any of those things. They just loved the Lord and they shared that love wherever they went. An encounter with Christ always leads to a response. It's possible, and I never want to leave this out, that there's someone here in this very room right now that needs a real encounter with Jesus. It's possible that you've gone to church all your life and you need an encounter with Jesus. It's a great day, a great opportunity to respond with joy to the outstretched arms of our Lord. It's certainly possible that every one of us in this room is acquainted with someone who needs an encounter with Jesus. They're your neighbors, they're co-workers, they're people that you know from other settings but they need an encounter with the Lord. We are called to be witnesses. We who have beheld the Lamb of God, we who have seen the Messiah, we are called to share the good news. And in sharing what Jesus means in our lives, something as simple as that, it may help lead others to respond to an encounter with Christ so that they can experience all the love, all the joy, all the hope that only Christ can bring. So dear friends, if you're sitting there, as I know you are, <laughs> we've all been blessed this day to have the experience of an encounter with Christ. Now how are we going to respond? Who knows? The response you give may not only bring great joy to your life, but it may also ultimately bring great joy to the life of someone else. And to that I say amen. amen. In a moment we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. And as we sing...
this hymn of invitation, it's I love to tell the story, it's so appropriate for this day. As we sing this great hymn of the church, you may be sitting there thinking, you know, I really need in my own life an encounter with Christ. I need to experience a fresh, a new, maybe for the first time, what Jesus has to offer to me. Or you may be sitting there thinking, I have a friend, I have a loved one that needs an encounter with Christ. I'm going to invite you to get out of your seat. Come up here and pray for that person. Pray that in some way, God will use you to be a witness to that person so that you can plant a seed, so that you can share the good news, that they can know Jesus. And folks, I dare say every one of us could be up here today because we all need an encounter with Christ daily. And I dare say that all of us could be up here because we know someone who needs Jesus. So in whatever way God leads you this day, you've heard the witness. Now it's time to respond. Our hymn is going to be, I love to tell the story. It's 156. Let's take just a moment to prepare our hearts to respond in the way God leads us. Let us pray. Amen.